I cannot recall for sure when I first heard the story of my birth or of how I came to be here on this earth. Like the story of my birth, I cannot remember when I first heard of the name United Kingdom. But my father gave the name weight in my mind. Whenever he pronounced the title United Kingdom, it sounded so heavy, so reverential. Going to the United Kingdom must surely be like paying God a visit. It was around this time that my people living in Lagos were preparing for the arrival of a town's first lawyer who was returning from the United Kingdom. A Messiah who had been to the kingdom of heaven and back to fight for the rights of false Ibuzo people. My father was so happy during this time and now that I had come to know that being a girl, I was a slight disappointment to my parents, I made a secret vow to myself that when I grow up, I must visit this United Kingdom to keep my father happy forever. It was a dream I kept to myself, but it lived with me just like a presence. Unfortunately, my father died a few months after this, and I had to go to Ibuzo with my mother to help her during her nine months mourning. It was then that I came to know Ibuzo, my homeland. I fell in love with the town. I have never seen so many coconut palms and so many happy people. The only thing that soured my memory of my early visit was that we children were always hungry. After breakfast, all grown-ups will go to the farms. My little brother and myself will have to wait for them to return before we had another meal. But in the evening, my big mothers, any woman in the family is called a mother. We don't have aunties or sisters. My big mothers will bring all kinds of things. Then we will sit by the moonlight and they will tell us stories. So I made another promise to myself. When I grow up, I was going to be a storyteller like my big mothers, and I was going to come to Ibuzo to live after I had been to the United Kingdom. I did not stay long in Ibuzo as a child. When I was nine years old, I had to go back to Lagos because when my father died, my mother had to marry an uncle as we do in our place. Without a father, I had to be almost like a slave in the houses of relatives. But my mother won an argument about letting me go to school for a while because she knew how much I wanted to. The idea was that I should receive a little education to qualify me to be the wife of one of the new Nigerian elite. But I had other plans. Without my father to look after me, I had to look after myself. Secretly, I sat for a scholarship exam and I won it. So I ran away to a missionary school because if I've stayed at home, I would have been forced to marry when I was only 12. My mother did not understand and started calling me a bad girl. How was I to tell her that I wanted to come to the United Kingdom, that I wanted to tell stories, and that I wanted to come back to Ibuzo, which had by now assumed the image of paradise? I stayed at school until I was 15, and then I could no longer avoid family pressure. I married the first boy I loved, a dreamy local boy who thought he could make it big in the United Kingdom too. At the convent school, we were told that prayers could move anything, and I believed in miracles. I found a job as a publicity officer at the American Embassy in Lagos. I worked hard and saved enough money to take us to England. He would come first, find a job 
and somewhere to live, and I will follow later. I was almost 18, a mother of two children, both under three, when my dream finally came true. I was on the deck of the Oriel, headed for England. Thirteen days later, the children's snores on the ship came into my room and bubbled. Have you seen it? Have you seen Liverpool? I ran up to the deck. If I had been Jesus, I would have passed England by. Why do we have to live in this dump? I cried when I saw the single room my husband had got ready for us. He explained to me that accommodation was very short in London, and if one was black and with children, it was almost impossible. But he accepted the situation. When I became very depressed and upset at the thought of my beautiful flat in Lagos with servants, he snapped, you must know, my dear young lady, that in Lagos, you may have been a million publicity officers. You may have hundreds of servants. You may be an elite, but the day you land in England, you are a second class citizen. But why? Because you are black. So it sank in. I got the message. My color, which until then I had never given thought and had always taken for granted, became a problem. I was no longer a young promising girl with a future, but a black second class person. That was what the white society wanted me to be. But I would rather die than accept it. I managed to get the type of job I wanted in a library and could afford to pay for daily minders for my babies. Because I was getting my way and it looked as if we were succeeding, our Nigerian landlord told us to move. I was the youngest housewife in the house and was a bad example to many others. It was during the time of our search for a place to live that I watched helplessly as what little pride my husband had left evaporated. For some reason, I could hang on, but he could not. We eventually found a place, but by then he had become disillusioned. He became violent against me and against his children, but he found comfort when he became a Jehovah's Witness. But I refused to join their church. I knew the marriage was at an end. So now the children were my responsibility, and I had to leave my job to look after them. It was then that I descended to the lowest ebb. Because of my blackness, and because I was alone, and because I was young, and because I had five children all under six, I was given one of the worst flats imaginable in the whole of London. I had to accept this because I needed a place to collect myself, to find my lost confidence and my shaking belief in me. I made a few friends among my neighbors. I was able to watch them in their survival war, but I always knew that I will soon leave what I call the ditch in one of my books. I went back to college to read for a degree so that I still had time to look after my young children. And in my second year, I started writing for magazines and newspapers. And this led to my first book being published in 1972. With my second book, Second Class Citizen, my writing career became established. I knew I had finally made it in the UK, but it was still not home. Home to me meant Nigeria and Ibuzo, and I knew that one day I must return. In 1980, I got a job in a Nigerian university after 18 years in the UK. I secretly kissed the Lagos Earth when I arrived. 
but my joy did not last. 18 years is a long time. Nigeria had changed and I had changed too. The Lagos of my childhood had gone. What was left was this confusion of a place, almost like New York. The people seemed slow, the streets dirty, and I felt the old community lost. Then I went to Ibuza, and this was the greatest blow of all. The landmarks were still there, but it was not the same place. Horrid looking monstrosities had been built over the places we used to play. I went to my mother's grave and f I felt a little kind of chill. My people were happy to see me, but most of my big mothers had died during the Biafran War. Now there were new mothers from a new generation. I realized that even though I had gone to live so far away, I had become a big mother too. Part of my soul will be in Ibuza forever. But I wasn't happy at the university. I missed my children, and every six weeks I went back just to see them. I knew I had returned to Nigeria too soon. I must go back to England and finish one job, looking after my growing family, before stepping into another. But before I left, I bought a piece of land to build a house, and I was given a little piece of a hard place as well. I now see myself like Jonah in the Bible, who did not want to go to Nineveh but who God said must go. Each time I travel to other places, you'll see me running back to my new home. Maybe for most people, where their children are and where they are happy, there is home. But I am not like Byron's prisoner of Shillong. When he was offered freedom, he did not want to go. My very chains and I, good friends, so much a long communication tends to make us what we are. Even I regain my freedom with a sigh. Now I am a person who has two homes, one in England and the other in Nigeria, and I belong to them both. I have a piece of land in Ibuzo where I will build one day and a house in London in which I live and write my stories. I think my father and mother would be proud of me.